right, ladies right. and gentlemen. Uh, I, I don't even know if this is your real name or your stage name, but we are here with Sydney Stevens. How are you? I'm great. That is my real name. Oh my gosh, mint, and we're doing we're doing sunglasses. So here oh, we go. Oh yeah, I'm sunglasses sun and cold brew. Cheers to you. <laughs> Cheers to you, brother. Uh, met you a couple weeks ago doing stand up here in the beautiful town of Nashville. Uh, what brought you here? Uh, the the short answer to that is like AJ. AJ brought me here. I was, I've uh, moved here from Minneapolis and the scene there is like super awesome. Mm -hmm. It's like one of the best scenes, especially like coming up, but I did a veteran show with AJ. We're both veterans. AJ Wilkerson. AJ Wilkerson, okay. yeah, AJ Wilkerson. We're both vets. We did this benefit together. We met, we hit it off instantly and he was like, move to Nashville. I want to start a podcast. Uh, the name's What in Tardation, and I was like, that name alone rips. <laughs> I'm, I'm down. And uh, he was like, I'll, I'll take you on the road and stuff. And I literally met him, and then like a month later, I was moving down here. That's amazing. Yeah, it was a really fast, uh, it was a really fast transition. What, what, what was it like? Let's, let's start off with how you got into comedy. So you are a veteran of the army. Yeah. How did you get into that, first of all? <laughs> I just wanted it out of my hometown. <laughs> yeah, really? <laughs> yeah, I, my parents, uh, they're doing well now, but uh, when I was like 17, 18, we were still pretty like poor. Mm -hmm. And like I knew they weren't gonna be able to pay for my college. So I was like, well, I don't even know what I wanna go to school for. And I could go do this thing for like three years, right? get out of town and have my college paid for. So how was it like a small hometown? Yeah, yeah, I graduated with like seven people. No shit. That's small. <laughs> so, so I took my cousin to prom. <laughs> <laughs> you literally read my mind. I was about to be like, how did you even uh, meet anyone there? Well, you apparently didn't. you didn't. <laughs> you know, they actually just passed a law in Nashville that you can marry your cousin. So no fucking way. I don't way. know where, what your uh, boundaries are, but. <laughs> I was like, I was like, who's putting their foot down on that law? He's like, like, you know what? Second cousin, not good enough. <laughs> you can marry so, first. How do you even have a prom? Is it like multiple schools get together? No, it's just our one tiny school. And it's not, they don't even allow us to dance because it, it was like Christian, but it wasn't a Christian school, but everyone on the board was very like hardcore. It's very purity Like culture. Methodist and like uh, Church of Christ. And it, they were like, you can't dance. So literally... Uh, the juniors would put together the prom and the prom was like a meal that the juniors cooked or had catered. And then we would have this roast. The juniors would will the senior or the juniors would like gift the senior something and the seniors would will the junior something and it would end up just being this roast. Oh. So we just roasted each other over a meal. That was our prom. Was this like your comedic uh, origin story? <laughs> Kinda, not really. I mean, it did happen in uh, in high school. Is this town in Minnesota? No, it's in Texas. Oh, Texas. I'm from Texas. All right, so we start in Texas, small town. Small bring town. Bring your cousin to prom, as you do. And, <laughs> yeah, and then you're trying to get out of the town. Parents, you know, you, you know, you know, you're a way out as the army. Did yeah. you, were you, when you thought about that, were you thinking, geez, I might have to serve in a war? Or was it just like, I just want to get out? Both. It was like, it was like, ah, that might happen, but really, I just want to get out. And both did happen. Both did happen, and I, uh, they wanted me to be a combat medic, but I was like, no, 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 I'm not, I don't do blood like that. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I ended up being a truck driver in the army, which... All right, so you're driving, you learn how to drive what style trucks? They're like five tons, like really big ones. The one that I drove the most was called a LHS, which it basically just has like a flatbed that you can like put to the ground. What are you driving? Nukes? Uh, <laughs> People? Artillery rounds. Artillery rounds. Artillery rounds, anything. Anything so that needs to be hauled. So, but if I'm an enemy... I want to be taking out the type of truck you're driving. Yeah, so you want to take us out. Yeah. We have the if shit. I'm an enemy. Yeah. I just would be like, <laughs> why? I don't want to go after the cutesies and the Humvees. I want to go after these guys loading all the artillery. Yeah, or whatever. I mean, at one point in Afghanistan, we were transporting water because we ran out of like water on our fob, on our base. So yeah, we're like the people to aim for, and we don't have. I shouldn't be saying this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, do you have like a lookout guy? Do you have someone being like, "What's you know?" Well, we travel. It's like a convoy, convoy. so there's like multiple vehicles, and like 
in between each one of like our trucks where we're like hauling important stuff there's like a group of like Ford uh, field artillery guys or like infantry dudes that are like all they're waiting for is someone to attack right. they're like ready to go and so you so you've got enough yeah you, know, you feel like you've trust a little bit of protection there yeah now what process is it is it like you know um i don't know field day where they decide who's going to have what job <laughs> they just like look at you and go well you're not front line you don't want to be a medic put you in the truck they well the army's different from a lot of branches because you get to pick your job like the marines they're just like you are this right this is what you are the army before you even go to basic training you get to like pick a job and then after basic training you go to training for that job and truck driving was just open they needed drivers what percentage of army are women it's gotta be like under, under 10 <laughs> not, not, right? not a lot dude i mean i hate to say it but are these guys like i mean are you are you like worried about them is it like bloodthirsty like you walk in the room and it's the first woman they saw all month Nah, brother, I had a shaved head. Really <laughs> <laughs> so blended right in. Yeah, everyone. So I've always been like the bro, the bro chick. Like I'm just like with the boys. I get along better with the boys. And I've, that's what I liked about your stand up is you kind of talk about being kind of, you know, that's kind of a part of your act from what I saw was, you know, talking about being a truck driver, being in the army, having what I wouldn't say are masculine qualities, they but are. they are, it's, a, it's, a, it's, <laughs> yeah. I mean, the majority of people that get into those, those industries are men. Yeah. Um, so, so was it natural to go from the army to, to being a truck driver? Was that? Yeah. Like, Cause I was like already driving in the army and I got out of the army early because uh, I went through a job training program on base to be a truck driver. Hmm. And I just it just made sense to me. It was were a high-paying job, and I still didn't want to go to college. Were you lonely in the Army? Like, when you were... Not like, in the like, Army. No? No. Is it, like, a civilian truck driver? Yeah, that was rough. Because you're just alone by yourself driving alone around? For hours. Yeah, that's wild. But in the Army, I mean, not even, not even when you're in Afghanistan, were you feeling... No, because you always had... You never, you're never alone. Did you have any issues with actually getting into any firefights or things like no. that? No, no, I got, I was super lucky. Oh, that's great. <laughs> super, super, we had like a couple of close calls, but, um, we, we got lucky and thankfully none of the times I went out and nothing like happened. The only, you know, the only thing bad that happened to me was a, a sandstorm blowing a wall over. Yeah, it's a bit you have, so I don't want you to say it and burn it, but that's such a funny it's bit. A, it's about, a true story. Yeah, so a sandstorm wiped you guys out? Yeah, we were, like, it was... <laughs> <laughs> the enemy you didn't know you had. I just love it. <laughs> I hear you, man. I've been stuck in an earthquake or two. Just just a little rubble, not, not a, like an actual big storm, but uh, that's, yeah, that's wild. Yeah, we were just setting up. It was like Ramadan was ending, and we had, like, one commu communication antenna, and so we're setting up these things called HESCO walls to, like, provide a protective barrier because we were expecting some, like, indirect fire. And while we were setting it up, we were uh, just waiting for them. But these walls, they have like chain link fences on both yeah. sides. And there's a Dunlap sack in the middle you fill with sand. So we had everything set up. We were just waiting for the guy to like fill it with sand. And then a sandstorm came and blew the whole thing and now over. now the sand down. Now yeah. the sand, dude. Gosh, remember when you're in the, a sandstorm, folks, you got to have your sand uh, in place there. Yeah, you got to have... But that's wild, though. I mean, do you... So... I have so many questions. My my father was served in Vietnam, okay. and I didn't even know I didn't even know him. I met him when I was twenty, and he has since died um, in part due to Agent Orange mm. it was on his death certificate mm. and also PTSD and things like that. So, I mean, having heard like stories of past military experiences, were you worried about the effects after you were serving as far as how you were treated by civilians here? Like, was it easy to assimilate back into this oh, culture? No, <laughs> it wasn't. I, w I wasn't worried about it at the time. I Like, I, I was just, like, living in that moment. But when I got out, it, that's why it hit me like a ton of bricks. No pun intended. But <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it did, like, trying to, like, be a civilian or, like, uh, reintegrate into, like, society just, it, it was hard. It was so rough. I mean, what happens? Do you just come back? Like, your flight comes back. Do you know in advance when your kind of deploy deployment's ending? Uh, a little bit. Mine, mine ended early because I had a waffle <laughs> on me. <laughs> but I was supposed to be there for nine months. I was only there for six months. Does that feel kind of good? Not good, but, like, knowing, all right, I get to go home, like... 
you know? Oh, yeah, I was so over it. Our leadership sucked. Everything about our deployment was trash because our leadership was just trash. Really? Yeah, it was bad. It was so bad. Like, our platoon sergeant was super sexist. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, I've talked about this before. He, like, tried to, like, insinuate, like, a, like quid pro quo. Like, oh, if you do this for me... I'll put you on, like, the good... The good Just a man yeah. violating his position of yeah, power. Yeah, exactly. Which so. doesn't happen often. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what, a man vi- trying to use something again that he could? Yeah. What? That's leverage. That's men. I mean, I'm not, I'm not condoning it. I'm saying it sucks. I apologize on behalf of us. Um, I'm you know, sorry that's... for all of our brothers out there. Uh, no, so whenever the option came up for me to, like, go back, because, like, my back was just fucked up, uh, from the wall, I was like, yeah, I'm fucking sure. I was ready. I was like, get me the fuck out of here and away from this asshole. Yeah. So I, I was down. There so was... then what? Did they send you to the uh, airport? And you get on the next flight? Like, I don't know. <laughs> I was talking to civilians. Right? <laughs> I am in Afghanistan. <laughs> what do they do? Do they go on kayak and get you a new? Like, what? What happened? Oh, uh, we go on Airbnb. And then, no, uh... <laughs> We, well, we were, like, a smaller outpost, so I had to get on, like, a Black Hawk and then ride that over to Kandahar, Afghanistan. And then from there, we have an airstrip. Then I get on one of, like, the big, like, C-130, like, the big-ass planes. Oh and then we go to Manus, Kyrgyzstan, which uh, is, like, south of Russia. And uh, from there, we get on another plane. We're there for, like, a week because we got to, like, out-process and shit and go through, like, customs and, like, make sure we're not bringing back anything. Sure. And then from there, we went, we flew into Maine. No way. Went, yeah. From Manus, Kyrgyzstan. Oh, no. Manus, Kyrgyzstan to uh, Germany, Germany to Maine. I was going to ask if that was a direct flight. So then, so then do you get a chance to stay in Germany or is it just a No, it was just, like, I'm in the well, airport. And then you go to Maine. Yeah. I didn't even know we had airports in Maine. <laughs> They're there. And I'm from New England. And I was like, no, I didn't know it. And then from Maine to... Uh, Louisville. And then w- at what point do they just say, all right, you're on... Do you have to call your parents and be like, all right, pick me up? Oh, no. I My my parents, uh, I didn't... Like, I wasn't ready to see my family yet because, mm. like, all this shit just happened to me. So I didn't even tell anyone I was coming back. No way. Uh, yeah, I just came back. <laughs> <laughs> Showed up one day like, hey, who needs some milk? I'll bring some milk home. <laughs> Well, like, because I was active duty, I lived on base. Okay. I, my parents were in Texas. I was stationed at Fort Knox, Kentucky, which isn't far from here. Mm. And so when we got back to Knox, me and some other friends who didn't have family there, we just went and ate bacon at an IHOP. Yeah. <laughs> that's, what, that's the first thing Hanging we did. Out. We just hung wow. out. Yeah. And so you said it was hard to kind of assimilate back into culture. What, was the, what were the steps like that you took? And, well, and how did you know that it was like not was it this did it feel like the same country that you left when you came back or was the perspective uh, completely shifted not like coming back after being gone in afghanistan the only thing that like really like sh- shocked me was like so much had passed like so much like technology advances and like the music was all new and all this stuff was going on but i i didn't get out of the army until like a year and a half later <clears throat> And that's whenever I reintegrated back into civilian life. And that's whenever I was like, whoa, this all feels really different than when I left it. Right. Because I was still, I was just a kid. I can't imagine. Yeah, you're in, you're in such a weird time. Because what, what are you, 18 to 20? 18 to 21. And is this right before the pandemic? No, this was, I got out in 2015. Oh, okay. So, so we're still way pre-pandemic time. So at what point does comedy, I, re- I read a, an article about you that you Googled an open mic. And at what point did you start to think you wanted to do something creative? I've always wanted to. I've all, like I've been obsessed with stand up my whole life. I chose it as my career in careers class, and my teacher was not happy with that. <laughs> Dude, teachers <laughs> suck. Yeah, but... God forbid. No, we love our teachers, <laughs> but God forbid you try to you want to do something that's not cookie cutter, and people throw on you why you can't do that. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I've always been obs- I, I've been obsessed with it. Uh, it's just like everyone else in my life was like, you can't do that. That's not a nine to five. That doesn't have a 401k. There you you can't like my parents. It feels like when I talk to my parents about it, they're like robots. And they're like, going to blow up or something. Man, I've been trying to really work on my boundary setting by, by having own, my own family 
and some some of them some of them are great but not really like um like in my instance um things have done been i'll have really started to work out about three years ago but for the first decade or so not so much and it's almost like they never believed in me until they saw that i could buy a home yeah and, and that means they still never believed in it they just know that it happened <laughs> so it's almost like they didn't believe in it they didn't even know how it worked but now that it's worked they, they they're like oh you must have done something right so a lot of people need to see some sort of physical success success yeah even though that's not what you need to see when you're trying to get your your dreams off the ground no you need to see a, a flicker you need to meet that person that says you can do this and so many families, I think in an effort to protect, mm -hmm. uh, don't. <laughs> and I think families, for the most part, are just ultra conservative, not politically, but conservative in the sense that it's like they just want you to be so protected. But it's like that's that protection is what seems to have hold you, held you back. Yeah. It's like they let you they were okay with you serving in Afghanistan, but don't <laughs> do a stand up comedy. <laughs> it's so wild to think about that, but that's actually true you let me go to kyrgyzstan or wherever the fuck i was <laughs> yeah. i had a I, I got wiped out by a sandstorm and you're afraid of a couple open mics <laughs> yeah. I mean, my dad was like so supportive of like the military thing i think because it was like prideful like my daughter's in the army but as soon as i was like i'm gonna do comedy he was like what <laughs> <laughs> oh man and I you'll get, get hurt it, it's easy to say what does your daughter do she's in the army oh congrats like there is yeah. a lot of pride that's easily translated with stand-up it's like you gotta wait till you go on conan o'brien or some show that <laughs> yeah. doesn't exist anymore and like that's the big deal and, you know it's hard yeah it it's, is it's, it's, it's a hard sell i don't hold it against them either like i understand like where they're coming from it's just i have like certain boundaries with it now where it's like if i'm really really excited about like a really cool opportunity in comedy i kind of just keep it to myself oh okay yeah oh, but that's sad to me yeah like, I, have, I get that but yeah, that's sad it's i like, can't i can't share it with my my parents just yet you can call me up i call you up. i have Dude, like there's no, yeah there's nothing better about the support system and we we you know we, we talk right now bonding over stand-up but i was in acting and improv and all these other things and it's the same there The getting an audition if yeah. you tell a fellow actor hey i got this audition for this thing someone who's not an actor might go but did you get the part whereas an actor might go dude congrats yeah. how'd you go knowing nine times out of ten or 99 times out of 100 it's not going to be a success story but it's like you're missing the point you know you and, got the opportunity yeah and the opportunity is huge and that's wild i mean i was brought to tears the first like major like audition I got because I was like I can't believe what that... was it oh it was when I was living in Boston we'd get all the like the small roles for all the local films so I auditioned for the town and all of the when I lived there like the social network which was the Mark Zuckerberg the Facebook film all of those films that filmed in New England we'd get a we'd get a piece of the audition mm -hmm. and like he'd audition for roles that Jeremy Renner would end up getting, you know, which is like the lead next to next to Ben Affleck. And you wouldn't get the part, but the casting director after would be like, hey, you actually did pretty good with that. Knowing full well the thing was already cast, you know? <laughs> but it was just like really cool. It was really cool. And I have an aunt who's um an actress and I could like tell her about it. Yeah. But I couldn't tell other people. But my aunt would be like, unbelievable. <laughs> you know, like, and it's yeah, you do. Your aunt sounds like Donald Trump, oh, yeah. kind of. <laughs> unbelievable. It's unbelievable. That was a tremendous audition. <laughs> Um, so yeah, it is tough. And even, even having done it for so long, I still will find certain family members avoid topics that I love to talk about. And it does feel like we don't have anything in common other than our blood really. Yeah. And I guess, you, I guess that's where I'm at. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's all right. I've like kind of like made my peace with it. Cause I have like a circle of people where it's like, yo dude, I got this fucking, I got to meet Nate Bargatze at Zanies, and I gave him a joke idea, and he wrote it down, and they're like, dude, that rips! Yeah. I tell yeah. my family that, they'd be like, but did you get money? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, no. They'd be like, did that pay you? <laughs> like, oh, that'll come later, don't worry about that. <laughs> so, you, so you Google an open mic in Duluth, Minnesota? Yeah, I, like, the reason I finally, like, started stand-up is because, like, I lost everything. I, I got fired for the first time in my entire life for, like, not a good reason other than I trained everyone from your trucker company no I was uh I was like doing like screen printing and like graphic design type stuff and, oh. like making like shirts and items for like businesses and uh I was helping with like production and I trained everyone in on how to use this new system we got and eliminated my position 
So, Jeez. I got oh boy, triggers. That's a trigger. Right there. <laughs> I was, I was like, fuck. But I got fired like a month after having knee surgery, so I couldn't just like go get another job. I'm still all like casted up. I had a really intense surgery, so I finally I was like, well, I'm, I don't have anything else left to lose at this point. I'm gonna finally do what I want to do. I'm gonna get on stage, and I just googled open mics. And this is like right after the pandemic. This is right after, I mean, some places are still like asking for masks and like checking vaccine cards. And I just like found this open mic in Duluth and I drove three hours up there in a no snowstorm. Three hours away. Three hours in a snow. Three minutes probably. Yep, three hours to three minutes. Were you nervous? Oh yeah. Did you have jokes written out or yeah. like, what was your plan? I had I had a joke written out at this, uh, comparison it was like an analogy about how my grandma is treating me like an antique vehicle like she's okay. trying to auction me off and then i had all these like you know it's a 94 model but uh it's had multiple drivers but the <laughs> interior is all original and it's just like stupid it was so silly but i uh I had like a plan, I had some stuff written out. I did my three minutes. As soon, I didn't even do three minutes. I think I did like two minutes and 30 seconds. Cause as soon as I got the light, I just put the mic in this thing and I got the fuck out. Did you out. tell the audience that it was your first time? Yeah. So you were, they were pretty supportive. Yeah, yeah, they were. I didn't say it, the, the host said it. Oh, jeez. I mean, I think that's, I always tell people like, you only, you get like a month to tell people you're new to comedy. Yeah. Tell them. <laughs> tell them, you know? use it. Um, <laughs> That, that's so how did it go it went great i got some laughs uh immediately hooked immediately i was like this is the this is the best thing i've ever done i want to keep doing this you know you got fired and i kind of feel like the world pushes us in the right direction if not very slowly yeah. you know sometimes um i wanted to do stand-up in college and a fraternity brother told me it was too hard like don't do it you're gonna make look stupid and he <laughs> talked me out of it i didn't start for like seven more years and yeah. I was like, you know, that sucks, but maybe I had some more living to do before I did it. Like, everyone's story's yeah. different. You know, I wasn't going to pout about it. I just looked back going, all right, let's stop listening to those voices and know when someone's telling me something based on their fears and projections versus, like, good advice. And it seems like while your guidance counselors or other people might not have thought this was a career path, yeah, you did a little living. Yeah. And, and then through that living, you probably realized you're willing to fight and die to do things that you want to do not what's gonna you know get, fill up your 401k <laughs> yeah i'll fight I, like i spent my whole life fighting for other people and it was finally like wait i'm people too i'm people too <laughs> what, what do i want to do first comedy special i'm people too <laughs> yeah seriously uh, um, what are the parallels between the army and stand-up it's one of uh, there are there are a lot uh my favorite thing and i think why uh i'm so intensely drawn to stand-up is there's a level of camaraderie you get with comedians that you just like can't find anywhere else like it feels like that camaraderie i had when i was like in the pits with my fucking brothers in arms you know if we're shooting the shit we're smoking cigarettes we're all trying to do this similar thing uh and like there's like this level of like support almost yeah it's like you're you're you yes stand up and other creative arts have to compete with stage time and things like that but you're not competing against each other no you're, you're trying to do the best you can on stage you're competing against yourself and no amount of you i mean if you if i have to go after you and you have a good set that helps me yeah unless you're like sets thunderously too good and then afterwards you're like fuck that guy bring her back <laughs> which does that's happen that's the worst that's the worst feeling you try to like ride off of someone else's like charm and, and the audience is like you're a douchebag yeah. like, oh i thought we were all having fun no that happens too yeah. uh, uh any big bombs since you moved here um not like in Nashville, not any big bombs in Nashville. I've ate some shit on the road since I've moved here. I've oh been yeah. Doing a o lot of road gigs. Opening for AJ or? or Thankfully for it wasn't when I was opening for AJ. It was, uh, I, I, I don't work with this guy anymore. It was with this other booker who just, he pays really bad. And it's just like, he'll send you like, he sent me to South Carolina and then I get all the way there, lay down, wake up uh, after I do the show. And then I got to drive another, 
eight hours to the next show, do that do that show after the eight hour, hour drive, lay down, wake up, drive another 13 hours to oh fucking gosh. Pennsylvania. It was a nightmare. But I remember there was this one particular place. It's called Indigo Reef. I'll never fucking forget it. It's in uh, South Carolina. And there, it was, there was like 40 or 50 people there. There's no stage where it's an awkward like room. Uh, there's no spotlight. We, I don't even think. Oh, we, that's the worst. We didn't even have a mic stand. I prefer a good spotlight to a good microphone. Yeah. Because it's, I, I can yell, but I can't yell so loud you can see me. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. and I feel like a bad, I feel like, I feel like bad lighting uh, makes it so that the audience can like not feel accountable. Like, hello, I'm here. You know, that type yeah. of thing. Oh, so that's too bad. And it's like people don't want to, they're like conscious of what they're laughing at if you can like see them. Right, yeah. Like I'd rather, yeah, I'll go acapella, but you better put a light on me. Yeah, it was, oh, it was so rough. I, I had to do. But that's I, great you're getting road work though. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a great thing early on in your career. Yeah, I'm, I'm grateful. I'm grateful for every bomb and every good set. It all it all adds up. What's your bigger like picture dream plan if every green light goes your way? If every green light goes my way, I just, I just want to be a, like, I, I'd, I'd love to be like respected by my peers. Like that means a lot to me. Like mm. other comedians are like, yo, that's Sydney. She's good shit. Yeah. And then to like make people laugh, to be like a more like known comedian. Yeah. I just want to, I just want to make people forget about their shitty day. There you go. That's it. That's in goal for think? me. I want to release a special with, uh, within the first five years of doing it, and I've got three more. There you go. Now, what sort of family life do you think leads you to want to be? I don't want to say a people pleaser because for some reason that's got a bad connotation. But I but am a people pleaser. It's, such a, it's like, well, I'm sorry. I want people to be happy, yeah. but I, but people pleasers don't get the respect because it's like I guess they're seen as pushovers. But like, no, you want like do like where in your family did you stand as far as like being the funny one? Oh, I, yeah, I was I was always the funny one yeah. in my family. Are you like youngest sibling or middle child? Or? Uh, only child by blood, revolving door of step siblings. Oh, there you go. Yeah, and my childhood wasn't like great at all. There was a lot of like tragedy, and like my biological mom left when I was thirteen. No way. Yeah, she up and dipped. That's a funny story. <laughs> Why did? Yeah, what's that all about? She just like up and dipped one day. She was just like, "I'm done. I don't want to live in this town anymore." And I asked if I had to go with her, and she was like, "No." And I was like, "Cool." And then she just left. So was it your dad or step parent? But my dad, dad, my wow. dad took over. So that's why I have so many like masculine qual. I was raised by my dad. Wow. And you can tell. <laughs> <laughs> now that you mention it, I was raised by my mom. Hey. Hey. Uh, I cry watching Adam Sandler films. So that's, <laughs> that's the difference. We complement each other here. Um, so what? Do you have any relationship with your mom now? Like, do you yeah. sort of empathize with what she was going through? Yeah, I, I feel, as I grow older, I'm like, holy shit, my mom was just like a 28-year-old just trying her best, yeah. and she just got dealt a really shitty fucking hand. Like, yeah. I have so much more empathy for her. Do you, you like feeling trapped in a small town? Is yeah. that what it was? Yeah, and just like getting involved with the wrong dudes. Yeah. The dudes she would date. Yeah, <laughs> just like, she after my dad, I was just like, oh my god. That's interesting. So as an adult, you're able to look at it and go, oof. Yeah. Just, you know, because everyone, yeah, you just, I love that movie Butterfly Effect. You ever see it's that a, movie? Yeah, it's a good movie. It's just, it just shows with diff. and I really believe that while we all have like a destiny, we're all a product of the hand we're dealt. And in hindsight, I, I came from like a really cool sort of middle class town where I was able to have a great high school, like things that a lot of people don't didn't work out for them. You didn't take your cousin to prom? Didn't, I know. What happened? Look at that. No. <laughs> but, shout out. Shout out. Hey, how are you? Uh, it's never too late. Uh, we'll be chaperones. <laughs> but, we, but we all have, like, I grew up, I was actually talking to my wife about this. I, uh, the first 10 years of my life, I lived with a sing my mom and my older sister. And they, I think in hindsight, I both struggled with their own uh, energy levels. I don't want to label them as depressed because I don't think, I don't even know if, if they've looked at it the way I have, yeah. but I go, Oh man, I lived in a quiet house with a single mom just trying to scrape by. Yeah. And I kind of like, I don't say race myself, but like, it was like, 
it was lonely and quiet. And this was no internet, no TV, just me trying to figure out how to talk to my Legos and get by <laughs> this thing. And I look back at it going, I actually feel bad for my younger self now. I don't yeah. feel bad for me, but I, I, I feel bad feel bad for that kid that I see because I go, gosh, you must have been craving a dad or something. Yeah, craving and then, somebody. And then at a time, my mom did remarry and I got that. But like, I'm a firm believer that those first 10 years are like, a real like you're stamped like yeah. you're done. <laughs> yeah that's it you can and like my stepdad was cool and taught me a few things and some charm and had to tell jokes and he was a lovely guy and i loved that but i was like my wounds were already done yeah deep. it's like a brand it's not a stamp yeah. you can't wash it off no, it's fucking it's in learn there. It's there if you don't see your brand then you're not addressing your issues yeah and but you can look back and go, geez, my mom was a single mom in her early 20s, no child support, trying her best. That's God rough. bless her. Like, yeah. we're, I'm, we're late 30s. I'm about to have our baby in a few weeks. And we feel Holy stressed shit. that we're not ready, that we don't have our shit together. And we couldn't have mo- our shit more together. <laughs> and, and so it's just like, I can't imagine the burden that is felt by, like, yeah, young parents. And then and then who knows? Like, I mean, did your, did your mom, wait, did, did you see a happier version of her when she got out? No. No, she was still. No, she was, <laughs> followed her. She, she took money from me. <laughs> no way. Yeah. I went up to go, like, see her uh, after she had, like, left. And I worked, like, all summer out in the wheat fields picking wheat with my bare hands because I worked at a research lab. And then I took this money up to, uh, down to San Antonio, Texas. And she ended up, like, taking my money because she didn't have money. And I was, I was so over it. I was like, man. <laughs> I have plans for that. <laughs> we were going places. But no, I didn't I uh I didn't really see like a happier version of her until like I don't know if I ever have seen a happier version Man. to be honest. I just have a lot of like forgiveness for her instead of yeah. hatred now. Man, for what, me. Yeah, what good does it feel to it's just poisoning yourself if you hate someone over their lot in life. Yeah. And it doesn't break the the sort of the chain of command it's like if you if you feel if you take that energy and pass it along you're going to be the person that your kid hates someday yeah and i'm not having kids so we don't got to worry go. about that there you go but no i've always said it like uh someone else's guilt is very heavy to carry on your shoulders it's yeah. a lot easier to just forgive I think that's so true, and yet it's so easy to say. And, and, uh, and I mean, for me personally, my father, I never knew him. So, like, when I did meet him, there yeah. wasn't like, oh, you left me. I wasn't. It was like, bro, we're done. Like, that was never even a thought in my mind. I actually feel bad for people that actually had absentee parents that had to deal with that. He, it was no, the, he didn't exist. Mm-hmm. So, like, I didn't have that feeling. But then he was the type that was very needy and never recovered from, like, he never aged past. I think where he was scarred from like war mm. and he just sort of stayed in this needy mindset his whole life. So yeah. he went through five, maybe even six different wives. I don't even know. I think my it's mom common was like, with the military veterans. Yeah. And he was yeah. a charming guy, but like it wasn't until his hospice deathbed that I think he might've had been in, you know, knew that it was too late to try to fix things that he just like, I feel like he just um, accepted it and then it, and then it kind of dissipated. So mm. it's like, bittersweet i guess but if the, if he felt finally that no one was out to get get him everyone was just trying to do their own thing and he wasn't a part of that and yeah you just you just see that everyone's story can involve like growth and redemption but for you it's not necessarily about your mom figuring it out it's about figuring out that like you're not her and you're not yeah prod- you're well you know you're not gonna have to live the way she did yeah that took a long time yeah i used to hate when people would like compare me and my mom I would, I would like flip a, that was like a trigger point for me. I'd flip a lid. I'd be like, I'm not my mother. Don't you ever. Has she seen you do stand up? No. Would you, would you be cool if she did? If she would be cool with it. Really? <laughs> yeah. I'd be okay with it as long as she knew what she was getting into. Cause I talk about it sometimes on stage. Oh, so yeah. if like, if those wounds are healed for her, come on out but if they're not uh, stay home. Yeah. <laughs> stay. Maybe give it a couple more years. Yeah. Give it a couple <laughs> more right. years. Yeah. I don't talk about it as much as I did in the beginning. Uh, When I first started doing comedy, I really, like, went heavy with, like, the darker side of, like, material and, like, my life. Whereas Mm. now I'm more, I'm just a goofball. It's tough. I mean, it's tough to sell that to an audience. You know, it's tough to sell. Yeah, I didn't have the skills. (laughs) You you might find, because I've been the same way where, like, I don't really do, I don't do too much heavy stuff. But some, 
you have it inside of you. So when you are ready to tell that story, it's there. Oh yeah. And you'll have, and you'll probably have time for like, all right, I burned all these jokes. Every <laughs> guy I've hooked up with, I've joked about that. Oh yeah. My mom issues. Yeah. We're going to so, bring that up. <laughs> um, tell me about your podcast before we go. Like what's, so it's called what in tardation, what in tardation and what in you, it's with AJ Wilkerson. AJ Wilkerson. And he's kind of like a known comic who talks about his autism. Yeah. And how does, how, like, how do you guys mesh together doing that? Uh, well, I have a brain injury <laughs> from the wall. The wall gave you a brain injury? Yeah. I got a TBI from it. So like, I also what does have, that even mean? uh, traumatic brain injury oh okay it's a, like a it's level up of concussion no basically. way yeah you get enough of those and enough concussions then like cte can develop were you like knocked out yeah for like a little bit oh but i was also the only person outside of the wall i thought you just kind of got a, your leg stuck under it no it, it hit me in, i turned my back to the wall when the sand came because the sand was coming so i turned my back and whenever i did that the wall fell and hit me in the back and slingshotted me forward and i wasn't wearing a oh. helmet my head broke my fall. <laughs> uh, so what? Yeah. how does the brain injury affect your day-to-day? Uh, it's, uh, it's so annoying. <laughs> it's so annoying. Because it's like I'm aware of it now, which is nice. But, like, it took, uh, it took like, my early 20s to, like, figure out, like, oh, these things are different for me now. Like, speech. I have, like, some issues with, like, uh, I get words, like, twisted together and tied up. No way. And then I have, like, this auditory processing disorder thing where it's, like, sometimes the words you're saying don't translate to me. So it doesn't, I don't know what the hell anyone's saying. So I have to be like, wait, what? Oh my gosh. <laughs> so like, I can't hear very well. Do you think it's slowly getting better or is it just something you, you're you kind of resigned to being stuck with? I don't think it's going to get better. So you too. So between his autism and your traumatic brain injury, yeah. you guys bond over just not being exactly um, societal neuro- normal. Yeah. Yeah. That's basically it. And there's like a lot, because I also have like ADHD. So there's like a lot of like parallels between me and AJ when it comes to like our like mental things, what we've got going on, like brain injury, ADHD, autism, ADHD. There's a lot. Yeah. A lot of parallels and we kind of bond over that. Well, everyone can go check it out. And where else can people find you? Uh, You can find me everywhere at Sydney Stevens Comedy on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. It's just at Sydney Stevens because I need to change it. (laughs) Amazing. Well, thanks so much for sharing my story, sharing your story with me. Dave, thanks for having me. This was so much fun. Thanks for the coffee. Of course.